Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. If you would like to make sure that I can keep bringing you more content like this, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. Welcome to Japan Station. I'm your host, Tony Vega. Let's just dive right into it today because、uh, there's a lot to say here in the intro, and I don't want to go on for too long. I don't want to bore you with all the details, but there's a lot of details. <laughs> so, my guest today is someone who, well, you may have seen him on NHK World because he is the host of a show called Face to Face. He also is one of the world's leading experts on the topic of Edo era Japanese. Literature. In fact, he is the director general of the National Institute of Japanese Literature, and he appears quite regularly on Japanese TV. He's hosted radio shows. I could go on and on. <laughs> so, his name is Dr. Robert Campbell, and、uh, he is a person that I, I was just utterly blown away by. You're going to get to hear. The story of how he learned Japanese, how he got into Japanese literature. You're going to get to hear about some of his interests in Japanese literature. And don't worry, if you don't care about Japanese books and stories and literature, don't worry. This is a fascinating conversation. This is a fascinating individual. And he's going to talk about all kinds of things, including Edo era famine survival manuals, like famines as in. No food, right? Like, we are going to talk about that. <laughs> It's really interesting stuff. So, how did this come about? By the way, this is an in person interview that took place almost two years ago. So, yeah, I need to give some context here. So, first of all, as many of you may know, I am the editor in chief of a magazine called Wasabi. It's published here in Hawaii, where I live, and we focus on both things going on in Japan and Hawaii, especially. Uh, we like to focus on the kind of intersection between Japan and Hawaii. So, when anybody prominent from Japan comes to Hawaii for a visit, we always try to get interviews.、Uh, that's how I've managed to talk to, for example, Crystal K. I released that as a podcast episode here on Japan Station.、Uh, I've also gotten to talk to Nishikori K, the tennis player, and a bunch of other really interesting people. And Dr. Campbell, you're going to get to hear that conversation today. So, anyway, I got this email from the University of Hawaii. Dr. Campbell was going to be here on February 28th, 2019, for a lecture. And that lecture was really interesting, by the way. I went to it, I listened to it. And、uh, that was about、uh, like Edo era promotional flyers for this artist. And Dr. Campbell was kind of like, Building a timeline and tracking down people and interactions, and you know, building like this kind of map of people where they were and for these like parties for the artists. It's just fascinating stuff. Basically, think like modern day promotional flyers. He was researching that, but for the Edo period. Anyway, so I go to this lecture, I try to get this interview with him. He says, I'll talk to you tomorrow at the Honolulu Museum of Art because I'm going to be giving a lecture there.、Uh, they're doing this like joint research project between the National Institute of Japanese Literature and the Honolulu Museum of Art for this really big like art collection that they have there,、uh, for、uh, including like Japanese items. Like, they have a really good Japanese like woodblock print collection, but also old books and tons of other stuff. So if you're ever in Honolulu, check them out. Uh, but anyway, so I, I go to the Honolulu Museum of Art along with the publisher of Wasabi, and we end up talking to Dr. Campbell for like an hour.、Uh, and we sit down in the courtyard of the Honolulu Museum of Art. It's right in the center of the museum, it's open air. So you are going to hear some background noise from people just walking around. You're also going to get to hear this moment, which is hilarious.、Uh, this guy walking by us, because again, we're just out in the open, sitting in this table, talking. Uh, this guy walks by, sees Dr. Campbell, stops him, and says, Do, do I know you from somewhere? <laughs> Because he recognized him from NHK. So,、uh, yeah, he's a well known guy. He's a well known guy.、Uh, but anyway, so you're going to get to hear all that stuff. And, and as for why it took two years for me to release this episode, well, for one, we recorded this in order to write an article about Dr. Campbell in Wasabi. So I had to wait a few months. Before I could release the audio because we wanted to publish the article first. And, and two,、uh, I emailed Dr. Campbell after the article came out, but unfortunately, maybe the email went to spam or whatever. You know, I, I wasn't able to get in touch with him. So I tried again a few months ago and then I got permission to release the audio. So because of scheduling things, you know, I had to release other episodes first. It took me 
like about two months to actually get this episode out. But it's here. It's out. And you can listen to it now. So I'm going to stop talking because uh, you'd rather hear Dr. Campbell, I think. Uh, <laughs> so let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Dr. Robert Campbell. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. I'm very curious about, well, for example, what you talked about yesterday at the at the lecture with uh, the scrapbooks and all right. that. Or also, another thing that I'm, I'm curious about is, you know, kind of what makes Japanese literature unique and what kind of makes it different from mm-hmm. other parts of the world, especially right. Edo period, for example, what was going on in other parts. But right. before we get to that, okay. kind of curious. So how did you get to... The for question, example, the yeah, that's the, that's the main question that you know, I've, and I've Japan, seen in many I interviews. I, I kind of know the answer. You've seen, that you've seen me sort of I've like seen you in Japanese and explain. Twinging I know. when people say Yes, yes, I know. But yes. we got to start from there a little I have a, a five-minute spiel yeah. to the reporter who asks me what was the kikake for these yeah. I say, come on. Come on. You've said it a thousand times. So, you know, Search I know me, no, you're, no. you're a professor. A professor of you told you in order to understand, you know, the Japanese art and and thank the, the you for, culture, thank right? Thank you for looking over there. Yeah, no, I, I've seen you say it many times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and he said you got to learn the language, right, in order to see to understand visual culture. Right. right, and and you were looking at art specifically. Yeah, I was a I was a freshman at the University of California at Berkeley, uh-huh. and I had studied French for years and years and years. I was oh. in Paris for a while with okay. my parents when I was like thirteen and fourteen, uh-huh. and from there I we moved. I'm from New York City originally, yeah. from the Bronx, but then we moved uh, to San Francisco where I finished where I went to high school uh-huh. and in college. Uh, and I was fluent in French, basically, and I, I thought that I would be doing something using that. Uh, but then I got into college, and I, I kind of thought there were two things that I thought of as soon as I became a freshman. One was yeah. that I'm really, really bad at math, and I got into Berkeley because, uh, I don't know, I had, uh, they had these uh, all-around SAT score formulas mm-hmm. where you didn't have to be good at everything. Mm-hmm. I mean, you had to have a certain score. And right, I was right. really, really good in the humanities part and yeah. really, really bad in the sciences. Yeah. But not terribly, terribly bad. So yeah. somehow the whole figure allowed me, it gave me a sort of free pass yeah. uh, into the university, which was, I'm, I'm very grateful for. But I, but I decided when I got into college that I was going to try to overcome that. Mm-hmm. And so I did a double major in economics oh. and what was then called Oriental languages, if you can believe that, East mm-hmm. Asian languages and cultures <laughs> okay. right now. <clears throat> Uh, and I had uh, advanced placement credits for about a year and a half of college time right. from high school. So instead of graduating early, I decided to do a double major and do two things. And one of them I thought should be something that I wasn't really good at, mm-hmm. you know, intuitively. So I started taking statistics mm-hmm. courses in computer science and got into economics and sort of rubbed away my sort of intuitive dislike mm-hmm. for, for numbers and things like that. And on the other hand, um, I took this course, uh, I took a comparative literature course when I was a freshman, the first quarter, first quarter in there, mm-hmm. that uh, it had nothing to do with Japan or Asia, but the young assistant professor who was responsible for the course mm-hmm. told us, I remember in one of the lectures, he says, the oldest novel in the world is called The Tale of Genji, it's from mm-hmm. the 11th century, uh, and there's nothing like it in the West for like five or six centuries mm-hmm. after that. And he just sort of said that, and I thought, wow, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. So I went off to the, to the bookstore, and, and Edward Seidensticker's mm-hmm. translation which, of The Tale of Genji had just come out in paperback. Mm-hmm. So I bought that, mm-hmm. and I started reading that. And then the next quarter, for another reason, I took a, uh, an introduction to Japanese art mm-hmm. in the art history department from Professor Shimizu, mm-hmm. uh, who's a wonderful uh, scholar. And uh, halfway through, he was showing us these genre um, sort of popular views of inside and outside the capital, Kyoto, mm-hmm. which were painted from the late 16th century to the early 17th century. There's a whole genre mm-hmm. of, uh, of uh, sort of uh, really, really um, uh, detailed uh, sort of bird's eye views of the cityscape in Kyoto mm-hmm. with clouds over them and you look through the clouds and you see all these people, wow. hundreds of people uh-huh. uh, doing 
the course of performing the course of their day basically and doing all kinds of things and there's this whole sort of genre of them and he showed a slide after slide of them and they were fascinating to me so I went to his office uh, over uh, hours of, uh, office hours and I asked him what, what you know I need some back material for that to look at it looked really interesting to me and he says well yeah, I can give you all of the references that we have in English and you should look at them but you should also immediately start studying Japanese mm -hmm. because if you want to understand what's going on in that picture you have to know the language mm -hmm. and it was like sounded so um, I don't know, it just didn't sound right to me. I mean, I, was, I thought, you know, being like a sort of, you know, sort of post-constructuralist, you know, sort of deconstruction generation, uh, snotty, arrogant freshman, I thought, no, you don't need to, you know, what, you don't need to learn a language in order yeah. to have literacy in, in, a, in a sort of, in a visual context. I mean, you can just see it, what they're doing, right? And if you know, you know, what they're wearing and what they're doing, there, there are cultural things there. But why do you have to, why are you insisting that I go tomorrow and register in a you know, Japanese language? He says, no, because everything, every Japanese illustration from this period has a story behind it and they're written. And you have to, and everyone who looked at any of these, these pictures that we're seeing, they were literate and they had all of this, a whole sort of world to channel when they looked at any image. And there are very few images uh, that are created in Japan that are just flat, realistic images, re reproductions of the world. Mm -hmm. They're all channeling or referencing to a tale, a story, a hero, uh, something in nature, that a poem, a lyrical moment or a poem or something that mm -hmm. the, a strong viewer of the painting or the picture will be able to recall and add depth to the experience of seeing it. Okay. And so he gave me this wonderful sort of lecture yeah. there, what, like 40 years ago. Uh -huh. And uh, and I thought, well, maybe he's, maybe, maybe, he's, he's, got a point. <laughs> maybe he's got a point. I don't know. Uh -huh. But I was already like working, I was already like taking statistics and yeah. all these other things that was taking me out of my comfort zone. Yeah. So I thought, well, why not, you know, sort of go step away from romance languages. And uh -huh. then there was an, an intensive beginner's course over the summer uh -huh. between my freshman and sophomore year that they were offering. So yeah. I, I signed up for that. It was like boot camp for two months right. where all you do is, you know, morning to night, you, you study the language. They have another language as well, of course. Uh -huh. So I did one year's worth of Japanese over the summer. And then I took my second year. I decided to continue, did second year intermediate Japanese. And then the third year, the, the next summer at Middlebury College in Vermont, they, oh, the whole, I'm with them. Yeah, yeah, they, I've, I've never been there, but uh, they're quite yeah. well known. Yeah, yeah Middlebury Vermont is a complete boot camp for like six languages, six or seven languages, yeah. and there's a Japanese school there. And I, f I went into the advanced uh, uh, level of that there. And so within a year and two months, I was able to to do uh, to to be finished basically yeah. with advanced uh, Japanese, which didn't leave me, you know, fluent and mm -hmm. able to write and things like that. But it was yeah. uh, it's really good. So I was able to. Um, uh, have access to things rather quickly in mm -hmm. the language to be convinced what Professor Shimizu was trying to tell me, but also use it in a, in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And so, but it was a long story from there in, yeah. for, to me becoming a literary scholar. I was right. interested in uh, city planning, uh, urban economics, mm -hmm. um, law. I had no idea when I was started Japanese, studying Japanese how I was going to use that. I knew that I wanted to be part of my career and my, part of my life, yeah. but I didn't know whether it was going to be something really practical uh, and that would help me earn a living right away, or whether it was going to be something completely, you know, absolutely having nothing to do perhaps with earning a living like studying Japanese literature. Mm -hmm. So I decided, I, I spent a year in Japan. Mm -hmm. I took off between uh, junior and senior years and studied at a place called the Inter-University Center in Tokyo, which is a, a wonderful s small school that is uh, put together a sort of consorti consortium of 12 uh, universities in the United States and Canada. That and what put, was it called? It's now? called the Inter-University Center for Inter Japanese Studies. Really, and we usually call it the Stanford Center because oh, okay. Stanford University administers it. It's mm -hmm. about 60 years old, 55 or 60 years old. And when I was there, there were only about 30 or 35 students and, and about the same number of faculty. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very intensive, a one-year program where they you, you end up being able to write and read and do all of the things that someone who's going to be a scholar uh, or a specialist in engineering. It's basically a really 
sort of Japanologist training center for language. Uh, and I was able to get in as an undergraduate. They wow. would take two, maybe two or three undergraduates a year. Mm -hmm. The rest were graduate students and maybe one or two law school students uh, who would be there as well. Mm -hmm. Now they've really expanded it. They have more students and it's still very, very good. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I was just thrilled to be able to go mm -hmm. uh, as an undergraduate. And I spent a year there. And I was able, to, in Tokyo, to see a lot of theater, um, meet writers, mm -hmm. uh, uh, artists. Uh, and I was amazed at how accessible mm -hmm. uh, Japan was, um, regardless of this sort of social access. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't need to have a lot of money, mm -hmm. <laughs> for one thing. You don't need to be in the moneyed class sort of to have really close access to people who are at the center of creating mm -hmm. things uh, in a way. You can be a student, uh, you can be further on in your career, as long as you have a sort of passion. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know the rules, you know, to, to get along with people and to be polite and to, you know, to be sort of, uh, I don't want to say humble, but, mm -hmm. you know, sort of uh, friendly with people and stuff right. like that. Uh, and it was just amazing to me. I'd never experienced that in the United States. I spent a lot of time in high school dancing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, uh, I, was a, a, I went to high school properly and graduated. But I also, outside of, of, of school, I danced. And I danced professionally on stage. Well, and, what kind of dancing? Um, modern jazz. Oh. Uh, not just not really dancing in the sense of choreographed dancing, but dancing with um, different bands, for example. There was a, a, a group called The Tubes mm -hmm. in San Francisco in the 1970s, which were very, very famous in California. And they had a whole show together with their, uh, uh, with their music, which was a part of the whole show and stuff like that. And I was one of their dancers for wow. that. And did a lot of things as well and sort of earned my way through. Yeah. Uh, through a lot of college uh, doing that as well but anyway I was used to not being to having sort of and, and being a dancer and being young and uh, gives you a certain access to things that you would not and you can see things and meet people that you normally wouldn't uh, just working in an office or something like that or being a high school student or a college student so that was something I was I was uh, I had a sort of um, a certain maybe sort of dauntlessness or something like that. It didn't really bother me, like looking up people mm -hmm. and, and right. sort of walking into situations and feeling comfortable and asking and learning uh, from those situations. So when I got to Tokyo, it was really just amazing because in the 1970s, late 1970s, early 80s, I was there for the first time, mm -hmm. uh, there was just so much going on. Mm -hmm. uh, it was still at the height of economic high growth, mm -hmm. but it hadn't reached the bubble stage at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and people were, they were really, really, of all different generations, traditional cultures, but also um, modern contemporary uh, art and culture as well, was, was a really, really live scene. And um, I, it still kept me interested in, in what I was doing in economics and perhaps doing something practical with mm -hmm. my degree, but it pulled me really into this sort of vortex of, of you know, sort of creative work and scholarship as mm -hmm. well. Um, so when I got back, I finished off my, my senior year at Berkeley and decided that I would well, I wanted to study more um, st uh, study more Japanese literature and, and become a specialist in Japanese literature and, and sort of use that either to become a scholar in Japanese literature or do something else. I hadn't really decided to get anyway. That's the very interesting. The long story. I mean, you know, it, it, it kind of came out of nowhere, right? Yeah, there's no there's no um, Andre Bresson. Um, kiss uh -huh. you know there's no definitive moment you know yeah. photograph that you know decides everything you know right, right, right. we say teki shunkan. Right. there's no teki shunkan at all in my, it's a complete accident a complete yeah. spiral staircase yeah, yeah, yeah. that uh, that i do that, which i love huh. So, okay, yeah, then you, of course, you know, you, you end up going to Fukuoka, right? Uh, Thank you, yeah. And then, you know, you, you go on to Tokyo, mm. and now you're Nigel, and right. you've done all this amazing stuff. So, I mean, but let's get to the literature then. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, I guess, what attracts you about Japanese literature, and uh, then what uh, kind of sets it apart from, you know, other mm. types of literature? Mm. What, what uh, makes it so special? Um... For, for me, there's, there's, uh, uh, for, for, in the first, for me, the, the thing that really drew me into pre-modern or early modern literature was the difference in language mm -hmm. from modern Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, uh, pre -mo earlier Japanese literature 
the prose and of course the poetry mm-hmm. uh, is very very rhythmical mm-hmm. um, the sound of it uh, Japanese uh, didn't read silently until the late 19th century mm-hmm. so all reading any text that you had would be read aloud we have a word for that it's called ondoku mm-hmm. as opposed to mokudoku which is silent reading so there's voiced reading and silent reading and mm-hmm. people westerners who come to japan in the 1860s uh, right after the opening to the west before the major restoration or even up until the 1870s were always amazed because they would pass through a town and they would hear people's voices mm-hmm. and, but they could tell that they were they were monologues they could they could hear people giving these monologues in their houses they would go by a temple and there would be maybe 20 or 30 young men and women together mm-hmm. reading aloud the same text and it sounded like they were chanting but it was obviously not a buddhist uh sutra or something like that they were reading aloud so people were always amazed westerners were amazed that people you could hear people voice reading all over the place and that was a way of communicating and and if someone had a book and you were working in the daytime and everybody came home at night or if you're in a shop uh, and there are no customers late in the afternoon someone will just open a book and start to read it and the young people around them in the shop or in the family will just gather around and listen to it so um, the literature itself was written meant to be read aloud so the rhythms and the cadences uh, and the imagery often is something that you can visualize in a sense through hearing it um, uh, literacy was, was, was high relatively to the rest of the world from the 18th century into the 19th century in Japan but that doesn't I'm awfully sorry is there, I'm just, you look awfully familiar to me my name is Robert Campbell Campbell. I'm from, uh, from from Tokyo. From Tokyo. Yeah. I think that's what from NHK. Yes. yes. Yeah, I have a uh, <laughs> okay. yeah, I have and a then, television. Then it's called Face well. to Face. If you yes. have a chance. It's, it's so Thanks right for looking see. for for <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. No, because you just and also I love your your. My my clothes. Thank you. From NHK. I'm sorry. Yeah, NHK. Uh, face to Face. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Great yeah. Great. yeah. R- write us a note if you the next yeah. time you see the the like the, the producers will be very happy to know that you're watching us. That's great. Thanks a lot. I yeah. enjoy it. Okay. Thank you. I'm, I'm Thank you. honored. Yeah. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Have a good day too. Okay. That's um, great. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, so we? anyway, yeah. so so um, that or, the orality of mm-hmm. Japanese literature basically is it's extremely literary mm-hmm. in the sense that it uses a lot of classical references, a lot of Japanese literature. Mm-hmm. To be a really strong good reader, you have to know the Chinese classics mm-hmm. as well. They're constantly referencing uh, episodes and history and, and heroes and philosophical, uh, ethical. Uh, sort of terms and episodes and, and, and ideas from China, mm-hmm. which came through Korea often, mm-hmm. um, but also just the sound of it. It just sounds like reading a... Sem- I remember being like 20 or 21 mm-hmm. and reading Sai Kaku, mm-hmm. who's a, a, a comic light fiction writer in the late uh, in Osaka in the late 17th century, mm-hmm. and just feeling like it was a, a jazz riff, sort of. Uh, he's just going on, and you begin to read, even if you don't know what it means, uh-huh. just to read to read it aloud. It has yes. he has this incredible, almost sort of repetitive, rap-like mm-hmm. uh, sort of rhythm in the, in the prose itself. So that's something that uh, that really drew me into it. This, this the it's not a flat. It's not just information. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's it sounds like you can hear the birds. You know, sort of chirping, sort mm-hmm. of behind a scene or something like that. It's very, very sort of. So that was something to me that was really fascinating mm. to begin with, and I mm. still love. Another aspect is, as I've become a, a, a broad, I've read more things, mm-hmm. is that I realize, especially sort of associated with the kinds of texts that we're, we're looking here, mm-hmm. is that Japanese literature basically is extremely peaceful. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there are a lot of war chronicles. Mm-hmm. There's some really, really bloody vendetta incredible you know revenge often this this story this this kabuki mm-hmm, mm-hmm. play itself which yeah. he's projecting here is a warrior mm-hmm. and right. it's a it's a revenge but right? Yeah. right yeah it's a, a revenge uh, play but um, a lot of it is just really really simple uh, people accepting their positions and what they've been given mm-hmm. physically uh, and environmentally and life and doing as much as they can with it and trying to sort of live together in that way and express the various the happinesses and the sadness and so forth and illustrated 
work especially is something that it just puts you in a very very sort of peaceful and not dull boring sort of monotone or monochrome sort of sort of mood but it just it it it's extremely relaxing <laughs> and i feel that especially in the last two or three years yeah. with the sort of geopolitical sort of situation that we find ourselves uh, in the world these days that japanese literature is really is somehow gives one sort of courage mm -hmm. to 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 go on sort of in a way and to engage with people in the way and it's very very social mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stories are social in the way that Jane Austen was social mm -hmm. but it's not they're not simply chronicling a certain social stratum mm -hmm. and the senses and the sensibilities mm -hmm. uh, of, of that stratum it's something that's that's much more um, sort of reassuring in a sense and inclusive I would say it sounds strange to say that Japanese literature of the 18th century is really inclusive and diverse mm -hmm. because it's, it's, it was a closed society mm -hmm. to the West. Um, but within the society itself, there was a great deal. I think that there was a great deal of trust among uh, classes. Mm -hmm. Of course, there were conflicts. There was a lot of stress. There was a great deal of, of unfairness from our 21st century point of view. Mm -hmm. Discrimination, certainly, against different classes of people, against women in, in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, on the same level, though, there's a, a great deal of, of uh, inclusiveness and, and sort of encouragement. People read, mm -hmm. in other words, Japanese readers, consumers of literature, read the expected literature to teach them mm -hmm. uh, and to help them move on in what was usually not a very easy life mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of ways, in, in ways that are similar to, to us as well. Mm -hmm. So they expected literature to have a certain illuminating or elucidating, mm -hmm. I should say, sort of elucidating or I don't want to say pedagogical in a pedantic sort of way, mm -hmm. but to have an element where if you're reading a book, you're not just reading a, a love story between mm -hmm. a man and a woman or a man and several women or the other way around, mm -hmm. but you're also learning something mm -hmm. uh, historical uh, about the place that you live in, uh, about the way ways that we have, we can solve problems between people and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's good about taking care of your parents in their in their old age? What 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 benefit that gives to you as a, as a human being? Um, and also very very practical things. A lot of literature has a lot of really practical advice. For example, women's health. Mm -hmm. um, we the definition of literature uh, from before 1868, which mm -hmm. is when the Meiji Restoration, which you know because you've done Gan Nen Mono. And the definition is much broader mm -hmm. than what we have today. The word for literature, bungaku, mm -hmm. is basically a translation of the English word literature. Mm -hmm. So the whole discourse of 19th century and, and previous literature was grafted onto a very, very diverse and very, very different reality of, mm -hmm. of what we call literature today in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it really upped the scales. It turned literature what what Japanese people had, what we call literature, into art, into fine arts in the, in the 19th century sort of way. Mm -hmm. modern, helped modernize the country, became an export in a sense, a way for people to understand what the Japanese culture is and so forth. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, it really narrowed uh, what we see, what comes into focus when we try to look at what literature was. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that there was no word, there was no one singular single word for literature in the Edo period. Mm. But there was a gradation of things which, which were fiction, fictional stories which were illustrated, mm -hmm. uh, poetry, uh, essays, um, uh, all kinds of other texts that sort of meld together with more practical and instructive uh, works as well. And we consider that all to be literature. Mm -hmm. So um, there's not this sort of clean break between mm -hmm. poetry and prose. Uh, and fictional prose that we see in the West that we, we would classify using the Dewey Decibel system mm -hmm. these days in the library. Uh, mm -hmm. In the, the reality of what survives from 1300 years of literary culture mm -hmm. is, is just much more, it's much broader and it has these really thick channels and interstices mm -hmm. between them that sort of connect them. For example, mm -hmm. I myself, I'm really interested. Mm -hmm. I collect, um, I collect 
uh, famine survival manuals from the 19th century. Interesting. Yeah. So from the 1800s, um, dur like leading up to the big uh, Meiji Restoration and all that, That's like right. when there was a lot of political turmoil and all that? Political turmoil as well, but then there, were, there would periodically be famines, uh -huh. food shortages yeah. uh, in Japan. In, in the 1780s, there was a very big one. In the 1830s, there was also, it was called the Tempo uh, Famine. Uh -huh. uh, and it went all through the archipelago, and hundreds really? of thousands of people were, were felt di victim to that. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that I've noticed uh, is that um, writers and intellectuals would spend a lot of their time once they, uh, and a famine, unlike an earthquake or a fire uh, or a water tidal disaster, is not something that occurs suddenly. You can see it coming. Mm -hmm. The price of rice raises, rises gradually. You can buy less and less rice for the same amount of money because it, it, the crops are getting worse. It doesn't hit you all at once if you're living in an urban area. Mm -hmm. So they can see it sort of coming. It takes weeks and months. Uh, to actually kick in and to mm -hmm. see that this is actually going to be a, a disaster mm -hmm. uh, and that people have to prepare for it. So what they do is they write these manuals for people uh, how to survive in a time when there's no food mm -hmm. to be done. Uh, and often those manuals are handed out. They're usually very, very short, simply made, mm -hmm. <clears throat> handed out, and often sort of destroyed after the, the, sure. the, the, the disaster occurs. They're very ephemeral mm -hmm. sort of things, kind of referring back to my talk yesterday, these mm -hmm. sort of ephemeral things that happen to survive. Mm -hmm. But they're fascinating because they're yeah, often kind of stories. They say? Yeah. They're, they're stories, a uh -huh. lot of them. Uh, some of them are really, really practical. They, they do really intricate illustrations of plants that are growing in the alleys in uh -huh. Edo that you can pick wow. and boil, but you have to be careful to, to take the poisonous uh, sort of aspects out of them. They did tell you how to do that. Then there are other plants that you should never eat, <laughs> and there are, there are illustrations of that. There are also small rodents and things like that that you can wow. catch uh -huh. for animal protein that's necessary. Mm -hmm. When it gets really bad, they take the bark off of trees, mm -hmm. uh, and then there are ways of processing that so that you can get calories out of it, but mm -hmm. you have to be very careful because mm -hmm. it can kill you. Um, women who are nursing young babies, for example, um, the, one of the big problems during a food shortage is that nursing women, they are not able to produce milk very, very quickly before they weaken themselves. That's one of the first things that goes. So what to do, how, what to do with your, how, how to keep your baby alive when there's a situation where you can't really get much rice uh, and there's no milk. You can't, there were basically in Japan, people would, um, would pay to have nurse, wet nurses, we have that in the West as well, basically you would take your baby to someone if you were not able to produce the milk, you would hire someone to wet nurse your baby, and there's a sort of system for that, and that just stops, no one can do that. So there would be net manuals about what to do, how to, how to uh, augment your, your nutrition or what to give the baby. So anyway, a lot of it is really, really practical, but in the sort of spaces between these real practical information, there would be stories about earlier famines and what people did, how rice is important uh, to, to life and how we should be grateful for it. But then there would be stories and episodes of people. Uh, there's one book that I have where uh, a man tells about uh, who is trying? He's trying to convince people that they should grow sesame in mm -hmm. their gardens because it's really easy to grow and it's very high in nutrition. You can lose, use the leaves as well as the seeds. There's everything. You can use everything uh, at the, uh, in a sesame plant. And it's all nutritious. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about a time, maybe 20 years ago, when a bridge fell in Edo, mm -hmm. uh, and he had to go out and look for his friends because he thought that they may have. Maybe 300 people were on the bridge when it fell, and they were all washed out mm -hmm. uh, into the ocean. And this is a major urban disaster that occurred in 1807. Anyway, he's, he's, he, he's recalling that in the 1830s mm -hmm. and saying that what they did was they spent a whole day walking around Edo and they got, became exhausted. But the whole, and the whole town was, was uh, up and ends because of this bridge collapse. Mm -hmm. And they had these pellets that he, that he had made mm -hmm. of sesame. Uh -huh. Sesame is that he has a special recipe. His family is a doctor, mm -hmm. and they have this where you make these sort of high energy, sort of sesame 
little dumplings that you can carry, and that and they can be dried, and you can carry around with them. And it, all you have to do is eat one or two of them, and it, you can get it will get you through a day, wow. basically, of, of not hard labor. Mm -hmm. And so he's giving the recipe for that for people how to do it. But then he also tells us this wonderful story of, from his recollections about how they went and found his friends, what the what the time of it was in that day. It's a sort of historical chronicle, but yeah. it's like an essay, mm -hmm. a discursive essay. And it, and it, there were also ones that tell us about the culture of, of rice in mm -hmm. Japan and how that's important spiritually to mm -hmm. people, uh, how, how we depend on it uh, for, for everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're, they're basically literary. There are also um, recipe books mm -hmm. for, um, uh, for people who see the famine coming mm -hmm. and don't want to have any food loss. Oh. So for example, you want to make sure that everything that you have in your cupboards are used entirely so there'll be so one person made a recipe book of things that can be preserved mm -hmm. uh, using uh, soy sauce or or sweetening it in order to, to stop the uh, fermentation of things mm -hmm. as well and they got recipes from all of the famous people in Edo uh, Ichikawa Danjiro really all of the famous actors writers yeah. painters uh, basically all of the really the top tier yeah. of, of cultural producers and they got the favorite recipe from each of them wow. for something that that you a celebrity cookbook celebrity cookbook yeah. uh, for things that last but also not just because there's a famine coming yeah. you might have uh, guests unexpected guests over the weekend they didn't have weekends in the Edo period but um, you might have a guest coming and then you need to put something on the table right away so it's great to have um, sweet pickled kumquats for example mm -hmm. to just be able to put out with some some tea and mm -hmm. so there's a recipe for sweetened you know sort of uh, kumquats that mm -hmm. you can use but which also allow you to to use them for a month in advance you know sort of to preserve them as well mm -hmm. so there's a lot of really sort of sort of go going in between waving in between what we would call literature as mm -hmm. fiction or essay or poem and all of these books have poems in them as well mm -hmm at the beginning, at the end, either in Chinese or in Japanese, and illustrations, really, really interesting illustrations of better times, mm -hmm. women um, pounding mochi rice cakes and mm -hmm. things like that, that are sort of hopeful, so that they can be lo looked at as sort of art books. Uh, they're really, really interesting stories, mm -hmm. but they're basically survival manuals, and they were not meant to, to be um, sort of piled up at the front of a bookstore, and you right. could buy them. They were they were necessary right away, and they were basically handed out. Yeah. So anyway, to get back to what I was trying to say, is one of the things that's really always really strong and a very very strong magnet to me in Japanese literature is the di diversity of it. Is that it covers not just uh, interesting tales and stories uh, from a long time ago, um, but is also uh, sort of directed toward the needs of the people, the first readers of them themselves, which really. Um, strikes us and I think strikes a chord to us again today because they, they're, they're instructive uh, to us as well and interesting and, and often the instruction, uh, the sort of elucidating aspects of Japanese literature is usually accompanied by laughter. Um, a lot of Edo period, um, fiction especially, is comical uh, and the comedy is used in a way to deliver important messages. Uh, not ideological, you know, from above mm -hmm. messages, but as I was saying, ways for people to, to live stronger uh, and better. So there's always this sort of double-sidedness of, of uh, something that when you read it, you've gained something that you didn't know before that may be helpful to you or may inspire you to do something. But then it's not just a didactic, you know, sort of tract, a dry tract. It's, it's often a very, very bawdy, uh, interesting uh, with a lot of wordplay, mm -hmm. which is impossible, very, very hard to translate yeah, sometimes. Very tricky, yeah. But uh, but really, really interesting and multi, yeah. sort of variegated, multi-leveled, mm -hmm. multi-layered uh, sort of text itself. So those are the things that really that make uh, Japanese literature unique to me. Uh, but even having spent about forty years reading Japanese literature, I'm mm -hmm. still. It's still like an endless tunnel to yeah. me. I still really don't see at all. <laughs> what, yeah, the more uh, you dig, the more you find, right? The more you find. We have a saying, saying that we eat dry squid in, yeah. in Japan often. And, and the thing about dry squid is the more you chew it, the more you chew it, the more the flavor comes out. And that's what like pre-modern Japanese literature is. Yeah. It just never stops giving. You know, uh -huh. sort of you can constantly. So <clears throat> is there, 
any sort of easy ink for someone that does not have your background but right. is interested in reading something from that yeah. era perhaps <clears throat> yeah um, there are great first of all if you if you, if you have a, a, a story or a writer if you have something a hook mm -hmm. already that mm -hmm. you know about for example for example the tales of moon and rain mm -hmm. by Ueda Akina your wonderful sort of macabre scary stories from the 18th century mm -hmm. and if you know that if you've seen Mizoguchi's movie uh, uh, Ugetsu Monogatari tales okay. of moon and rain which a lot of people m movie people yeah. film uh, enthusiasts in the West have seen they, they might want to go to that mm -hmm. and see what that's about mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of uh, stories for example Akira the manga yeah. is is based on on some Edo period stories mm -hmm. uh, as well a lot of that is in there it's channeled in there so mm -hmm. if you have a hook already th that you want to go into if you're really interested in Japanese sweets or Japanese food for example mm -hmm. you can that can bring you that can be a bridge into mm -hmm. reading something about the area that that food is from or where it's from or something like that so there are different ways of getting into it one thing I would recommend <clears throat> is to go to a library okay. and uh, check out one of the really good anthologies uh, of, of Edo literature that have been put out in the last 10 years or so in English in English really? yes I'm an Edo period um, right. early modern spe specialist so I would recommend there are two um, two works that have come out that are really, really good. One is uh, through the University of Hawaii Press, mm -hmm. uh, which is called An Edo Anthology. An, okay. an Edo Anthology. It's edited by Sumie Jones. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the contributors to it. Mm -hmm. The last, it's a three-volume work. The last volume is about to come out. Mm -hmm. But it's a three-volume, wonderful, really, really complete anthology of the, th of the 260 years of the Edo period. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a one-volume um, pillow Mm -hmm. sized uh, a book uh, which was edited by uh, Haruo, Haruo Shirane mm -hmm. at, uh, at Columbia and it's out of by Columbia Press which I don't remember the title of it mm -hmm. but it's an anthology of Edo period literature okay. you can you can look at yeah, it, look it, it right up, away yeah. those two anthologies really give you a broad mm -hmm. view of the whole thing if you're interested in, in literary history yeah. uh, Donald Keene's world within walls mm -hmm. is there of course you can have a broad it gives you a, a broad sweeping broad strokes so sort of Japanese Japanese literary history and broad strokes in a sense mm -hmm. uh, you can you can sort of go through it and see the areas that might be interesting mm -hmm. uh, to you uh, but there are all sorts of other sources online yeah. uh, as well um, so as we're kind of finishing up mm. I want to go back to your lecture yesterday. Okay. Um, and you mentioned something really interesting that I, I, I almost wanted to just ask you right at the end, but I figured I'll just ask you today. <laughs> okay. Um, you mentioned that first uh, kind of accordion-like pamphlet you found in like a bookstore or something like that. Um, right. The, ah, right. Yes, the first yes. book that I was doing. Yeah, the very first one they were right, talking yes, about, right? right? right yeah. um, and it was like a small pamphlet. It's really small. Right? It's not a pamphlet. It's a it's sort like of, a, it's about this thick and it's an accordion. It's an album that you yeah. can just open up like an accordion. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And so, but you just found it in like a random bookstore? <laughs> no, or, I or? found it uh, in the catalog of oh, the bookstore okay. stuff. And I, 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 buy books from lots of old book antiquarian booksellers in Japan so oh, okay. once you buy something uh -huh. uh, they will they'll send you their catalogs whenever they gotcha. come out. Okay, because I was wondering, like, you found this, like, what, right. 1700s, 1800s? No, no, it's, it's early 19th century. Early, early 19th, 19th century, century, but still, you know, you yeah. just found it in some random books, or I thought that was yeah. a pretty No, I do that find. often. That happens, yeah, no, that, <laughs> that happens, happen a, that happens a lot. In yeah. Tokyo, especially, because yeah. Tokyo, is, as an area, it's unique in the world because it has an area of only uh -huh. old bookstores. So you right. can go to, like, 20 bookstores uh, in one 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 block basically yeah. and they have a lot of old things and then there's also there are also um how do you call it uh koshoichi markets mm -hmm. sort of markets for old book old markets book markets, old yeah. book markets. Mm -hmm. there's a center in in this area mm -hmm. where on a on fridays and saturdays mm -hmm. they have a, a sort of book market fair mm -hmm. where different old book uh, sellers come together and they have different groups mm -hmm. of maybe five or six booksellers and they get together and they mm -hmm. put out all of their wares uh, but the, and they have their own dealer auctions that go on so there's always something new mm -hmm. when you go to it yeah. so there are all these different ways and then twice a year there are big auctions also mm -hmm. uh, in Tokyo there's one in Osaka as well that I go to to see the previews and then buy things from that as well so and then you buy, we can buy online as well mm -hmm. now there's a really good uh, old book store there's an old book 
、uh, online source、mm-hmm. called、uh, Nihon no Furu Honya,、mm-hmm. uh, which deals in mostly Western stuff,、mm-hmm. but there are still old、uh, Western style books.、Yes. I don't mean Western stuff, I mean modern, modern editions rather than、oh, okay. uh, old uh, books. Like reprints? Would, would that, is that what you mean? Or no, I no? mean、uh, Western style books like your newspaper. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha.、Um, okay. What, what we're talking about are, are, are thread bound、oh. Edo period sort、okay. of books themselves, traditional books and stuff、mm-hmm. like that. And also、uh, Yahoo, Yahoo auctions, Yahoo auctions、yeah. is something, is a, is a, a, a lot of commerce in old、mm-hmm. books、uh, goes on that way. So there are、like, all sorts of different sort of paths that I followed.、Um. Have you ever just found like a hidden gem that, like, kind of、uh-huh. antique roadshow style where you go, like, oh,、right. they didn't even know that this was like such、uh, an amazing thing?、Like. Yeah, yeah, it's happened.、Uh-huh. Uh, in Paris, once I found a, a wonderful collection of, of, of polychrome maps、uh-huh. from, the, from the late 18th century. Yeah. In a flea market,、wow. a flea market on the outside of Paris.、Wow. And, and it wasn't cheap, but it、yeah. certainly wasn't what, what the price that it would, would have been worth in, in Japan, I think.、Uh-huh. Um, Interesting. And、uh, yeah, I often、um, I'm really interested in the province of books.、Mm-hmm. Um, Japanese book collectors often will stamp,、mm-hmm. will create an ex libris、mm-hmm. sort of stamp、mm-hmm. for themselves w- with their name or their pen name. So you have to know what the pen name is. For the, for the, they'll have collectors' names,、mm-hmm. a, a name that they use, a very an elegant name, nom de plume,、mm-hmm. which would be used just to create a stamp to show their ownership of it.、Mm-hmm. And a book will often have three or four or five or six or ten stamps as they pass hands from people to people. So to trace the provenance of a book is really, really interesting because、mm-hmm. if you can tell what sort of social status the, or what region the person is, it, it lets you know. It's just like a CV of、mm-hmm. the book itself over the, over the, the centuries.、Mm-hmm. So I'm always, I pay a lot of attention to、uh, anything that's written into the back of the book,、yeah. um, dedications, for example, or st- stamps. And、mm-hmm. I've come across some really, really good books that.、Oh, really? Themselves are just normal books from the 18th century, the 19th century, but they were owned by people who were really, really important.、Wow. Um, one of the, there was, I have a, a book, an illustrated、uh, gazetteer of Kyoto, which、uh-huh. was published in the、uh, late 18th century, which was owned by one of the first Western. Western, Western style painting instructors in Japan, a fellow named Wagner,、mm-hmm. who was there. And he basically, in, 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 his, in, in alphabet, basically signed、uh, each of the volumes of the book. I mean, it's fascinating because he's really, he's, he was the sole mentor for the first generation of Western style painters、uh, in Japan. So to be able to see the sorts of things that he was sourcing and, and being interested in image wise、mm-hmm. uh, is, is another way of thinking about his. Connection with these young Japanese artists as、mm-hmm. well. So, yeah, no, I've, I've found a lot of really sort of interesting things that you would not be able to、uh, understand the value of just by texting, by turning them into text.、Mm-hmm. The, the actual, the sort of physical materi- materiality of themselves really tell us a lot about what the book meant, what was interesting about it, the story, and so forth.、Mm-hmm. So, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, just kind of last thing, but. From everything we've talked about today and then yesterday with the whole, like, I mean, they were like chirashi basically, right? Like, they were、yeah. like, like flyers, like flyers. handout flyer handout kind of、flyers. things that you would see today. That you, you, aside from your appreciation for the art, the words, and the way it's written, and、uh-huh. the kind of the fact that perhaps a long time ago it was re- written to be read out loud and all、mm-hmm. that kind of thing. I get this feeling that you just really enjoy getting to peek into the history, like、uh-huh. these little moments. Yeah, there's something very voyeuristic about、uh-huh. being a, 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 an historian or、uh-huh. a literary historian. I'm not just a literary historian, I'm also、yeah. really interested in, in,、uh, in uh, analyzing and, and cr- criticizing the texts、mm-hmm. themselves. But you get these windows that,、yeah. that sort of pop up. And there's something about, especially my field in the later 18th century and 19th century. You can, if, as long as the more that you scratch,、mm-hmm. it's like these sort of, what do you, what do you the, call these? The, the lottery scratchers? Yeah, lottery scr- <laughs> yeah, it's like a lottery scratch. I really、yeah. feel that way. As、uh-huh. long as you, you keep doing it, you don't give up. It, they reveal、um, events,、uh, very, very personal moments and events in people's lives,、uh, material culture. Uh, they reveal themselves the more, that you,、uh, the more that you spend time looking at the books themselves, the documents themselves.、Mm-hmm. Historical documents, but also bound books、mm-hmm. as well. And also the fact I really like books because, unlike historical documents, historical documents are, meant, are made by one person 
uh, in, to be delivered to one person, basically, or to be deposited as proof that something occurred, uh, that debts were paid, uh, divorce occurred, uh, succession happened, whatever. But books are basically created by a group of people, if it's a printed book, and they're meant to be consumed by a lot of people. Uh, and to have that sort of space, to imagine what one particular woodblock edition book from the 17th century, the 18th century, the 19th century, what, th what sort of trajectory it had after being actually printed, uh, and imagining that, and, and sort of lottery scratching to see if it was carried into the provinces by a, a book lender, for example, uh, read by young women who were working uh, and reading at the same time with each other, um, all of the different sort of aspects of it that you can get uh, from the sort of, from actually the, the text themselves as being books is something that, that's really, really, really sort of interesting to me. Yes, so as I said, again, it is something that's intrinsically voyeuristic mm -hmm. about it. You, oh, you feel great. that you're... You see like these little papers that, you know, mm -hmm. they're supposed to be gone. Like they shouldn't right. be here. Yeah. Anymore. They shouldn't be here anymore. But you they should have peaked that moment. Oh, they had a party on this day. It yeah. was, <laughs> it was and you can and you can make a map of uh -huh. uh, of what was going on. And the yeah. material that I introduced yesterday yeah. is marvelous because there's a time limit of like four years uh -huh. within which we know everything that's on it occurred. Yeah. Uh, and they were in the hands of someone who was really active mm -hmm. in that whole scene itself. So it's really like a, a t like a watermelon slice, mm -hmm. you know, of the period yeah, itself. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have it in your hand, you're just about to bite into it. Right. So that's something that's constantly, you know, and things survive in Japan. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, c c think of the natural disasters. I know. Yeah. And the upheavals. The fires. The fires, the earthquakes, yeah. the water. Uh, disasters and the upheaval of the last 150 years, mm -hmm. the modernization, what that's meant mm -hmm. to the physical infrastructure of the country, the amount, the density of literary documents mm -hmm. and all kinds of documents that survive is amazing mm -hmm. to me. Uh, and that's something so, yeah, so that's, I, I, the, the tunnel continues. Yeah, last thing. Right. So, even the guy just right now, he said, I love your jackets. <laughs> I think you're kind of well known for that. Sorry, quick interruption here, but the audio wasn't particularly good in this little portion, so I thought I'd jump in and explain. So the publisher of Wasabi actually asks Dr. Campbell here a question. He explains how Dr. Campbell is always just so well-dressed when he appears on TV, and so he was wondering where that sense of fashion or style came from. Uh, you enjoy? Uh, yeah, I enjoy. Uh, I, yeah, I really enjoy. Well, I, I didn't. I don't come from a, 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 a an academic background uh -huh. at all. Uh, and as I said, I was dancing when I was a teenager, yeah, and yeah. so I'm like really. Uh, it's really interested in, in, in things that somehow within me connect to everything that I, I mean somehow there's a there's a, a sense of things that, yeah. that they connect to each other but to passers-by <laughs> I mean my god where is this this guy is like you know going in like five different directions uh -huh. and it seems and I'm really impressed that my that the, the people at the Institute I mean the National Center of Japanese Literature for them to knock on my door and say hey would you like to come and be the general director yeah. you know the first foreign person to do that obviously amazing, and yeah. someone who's uh, I have a very firm setting in the academic world, of course, in Japan, and I write a lot and, mm -hmm. and involved with in all of the societies and so forth there. Mm -hmm. But I also have a very, very unacademic public um, uh, identity mm -hmm. as well, and I do work with people who have nothing to do with anything that's academic at mm -hmm. all. And I'm, you know, I'm doing a uh, an internet. Uh, show with uh, Momokuro. Uh, oh yeah, an Momokuro. Yeah, 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 an yeah, idol group. Doing, yeah. yeah, an idol group. We yeah. have a, a great show. We do it once What's a it week. Called? It's called uh, F no Idenshi. Oh, okay. I'll look it uh, up. And F goes for fetishism. It's uh -huh. all about. I wanted to do something about fetishism. Feti uh -huh. Fetishism yeah. with uh, with them because they're really really interesting. I've known them since they started out. Really. Uh, and I really like them a lot. Uh -huh. uh, and there we we work together really really well. So. Mm -hmm. um, I had an, I wanted, a producer came and said, mm -hmm. we, we want to do something on the internet. We don't, a television uh, channel, they wanted to do, so they want to um, increase their presence on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, and they want to do some original stuff. So can think up an idea. So I thought up this, mm -hmm. this sort of conception for, for a show. Wow. And they were willing to do it. And it started about maybe two or three months ago. So well, if that's you really check fun. It out, I will check it out. Yeah, look it up. Look yeah. it. It's really kind of wild. But anyway, the to get back, the mm -hmm. idea that 
the consensus of the Japanese literary uh -huh. academics world was that I would be appropriate being the director <laughs> there is something that really is reassuring to me that uh -huh. they're really, really inclusive. Yeah, in you way. would think super conservative world, you know. And it is, uh -huh. and it is, <laughs> and it is. But, but that doesn't, people. but uh -huh. that doesn't prevent them from imagining uh -huh. uh, and trusting. Uh -huh. uh, someone to, to come in and do that. So yeah. it's been a really, really interesting uh, adventure for me also to sort of commensurate and to pull together a lot of the strings and the, and, and the things that I've had that are separate from mm -hmm. each other in a way and sort of bring things together. I, br I brought a lot of people outside of the academic world to the Institute. Mm -hmm. um, we've begun an, a, an artist in residence program. Mm -hmm. So we have some really, really wonderful artists who have come in. I've gotten funding from the, the cultural agency, the Bunkacho, mm -hmm. to hire people within the institution and also to bring in artists to use the resources that we have and to navigate with them to create animation, mm -hmm. uh, sure. to create plays. Uh, Kawakami Hiromi is a, is a great novelist and she mm -hmm. is using our work to write a modern novel which mm -hmm. is in, in serial right now mm -hmm. uh, as well. Two young contemporary women uh, mm -hmm. artists who just uh, joined up. Mm -hmm. So uh, bringing in all of this sort of new so at comedians, I, I brought in Matayoshi oh, really? son last year, and we he, had. He wrote a novel, I believe, a few years ago. Right? Yes, he did. And it was and, very and, popular. Yeah, and, and yeah. he got the Octagawa Prize. Yeah, 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 as well. He's a wonderful that. comedian as well. Mm -hmm. So yes. he came, and we had an open uh, dialogue, which was turned into a television show, oh, wow. and uh, doing all kinds of things like that. That mm -hmm. that somehow crossed the you know sort of the the waters. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well, and that's something that that I think people uh, in the very very conservative and very rigorous uh, world of, of of scholarship in Japan understand now is not something that that's to be sort of um, is not something that's threatening. Yeah, and that's entirely opposite. It's something that can be used yeah. to accelerate and to interest people uh, and to sort of broaden our own you know, sort of yeah. position. There's nothing wrong with it's being just, accessible. Yeah, nothing wrong. And it's also something that's, this is, our interview has ended, your time mm -hmm. is up, I know, yeah. but something that's been fascinating to me in the last two years, mm -hmm. um, leaving the university and my safe, you know, mm -hmm. sort of uh, small castle at the University of, of Tokyo mm -hmm. to going to a large national institute is that the people that come in outside of scholarship, the artists, uh, the translators, uh, comedians and people like that, the interaction that we have with the scholars not doesn't just um, so promote what we're doing and share the resources that we have with them so that they can use that as material for their own creation. It also rebounds, mm -hmm. uh, uh, reco sort of comes back on us. And I yeah. see, especially the young faculty mm -hmm. uh, at our institution, the, the way that they look at their work uh, is changing a little mm -hmm. bit. Often, already a couple of people have written articles where they quote these artists and what they learn from working with them, which is something that's just absolutely unknown. Yeah. I mean, in, an, in a Japanese academic article, to to, quote a to give a to, a to give a, f a footnote mm -hmm. about I noticed this because of a, of an actor's workshop that we yeah. did with Nagatsuka Keishi, mm -hmm. and we realized that there's a certain physicality mm -hmm. uh, in the text, and that allows us to step into the next right. level and analyze it in a different way. And so she, she made this wonderful sort of footnote that <laughs> I noticed and that made me want to cry. <laughs> but I don't think anybody else would really get yeah, really excited you, about it. Yeah, you open yourself up to new perspectives yeah, but the and fact you learn new things yeah, in the process. The right? fact that it's a two way, yeah. you know, it's a, a double sort of bind that people in is something that's really encouraging. So that's I'm wonderful. happy about that. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Not at all. Thank you for, for pulling me out of it. Yeah, yeah no, of course. No, no, If you want to keep up to date with what Dr. Campbell is up to, you might want to follow him on Twitter, or you can check out his website as well. Links in the show notes. Uh, I believe that he is going to be ending his time as the Director General of the National Institute of Japanese Literature in March of 2021. So afterwards, I'm sure he's going to be working on a whole bunch of other interesting stuff. But uh, if you want to keep up to date with all that, then again, Twitter or maybe his website, those are two good places to check out. But uh, again, link in the show notes, check your podcast app or japanstationpodcast.com. If you want to check out that TV show that he mentioned he was doing with Momoito Clover Z, well, you're in luck because I did find it on YouTube. They have a YouTube channel 
and I will include the link in the show notes. Now, that is in Japanese, so if you don't speak Japanese, then maybe it's not that interesting to you, but just in case, the link is there. And one more thing, if you want to pick up any of those books that Dr. Campbell was talking about, not the ones from the Edo period, but the ones that are good for people looking to get into Japanese literature, then why not use the Japankyo Amazon affiliate link that will support the show and it won't cost you anything extra. That's japankyo.com slash Amazon. And finally, I just want to mention one more thing. And that is that, uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, there is another episode of Japan Station which was also recorded on the same day as this interview. So, as I mentioned in the intro, this took place uh, almost two years ago. It took place on March 1st, 2019. The morning of March 1st, I actually interviewed Barry Lancet, the author of the Jim Brody books. And uh, you can listen to that conversation in episode 18. By the way, the Jim Brody books are great. Highly recommend them. If you want to check them out, japankyo.com slash Amazon. But anyway, that morning I talked to Barry and then Barry, the publisher of Wasabi, and I all go out to lunch here in Hawaii. And then afterwards, Barry goes his own way. And that afternoon we go to the Honolulu Museum of Art where I did the conversation that you just heard. So if you haven't listened to episode 18, uh, go back and check it out. And then you will have heard two hours of my life from March 1st, 2019. <laughs> and by the way, I know I said this really briefly in the intro, but if you're ever in Honolulu, check out the Honolulu Museum of Art. They really have some great uh, pieces of Japanese art and uh, some some great exhibits there too. Um, they just recently had the uh, the Great Wave by Hokusai, which is perhaps like the most famous Japanese woodblock print like ever uh, on display. And I went there just a few months ago, like I said, uh, and actually saw it in person, and that was great. It was a great experience. So uh, if you're ever in the area, you might want to check it out. They don't always have that one up on display. In fact, they rarely have it up on display, but they always have something up. They have the third largest collection of ukiyo-e woodblock prints in the United States. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and for you patrons, stay tuned until after the outro music because I will be including a little extra something uh, there from my conversation with Dr. Campbell. And part of it does focus on the Honolulu Museum of Art. So I think we can get to the usual stuff, which is if you have any questions or comments, send them over to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. Any new projects or something like that, you can also reach out via the email Remember to follow on Facebook and Twitter at Japankyo News. The Twitter has been getting a few new followers lately, so why not check it out? Hit that follow button. Hit a few retweets. <laughs> Would be greatly appreciated. Uh, and then also, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Leave a rating and a review. Thank you so much to Yunomi know for providing the opening closing song, Oida Controller. More information in the show notes. And that does it for this episode. Come back on February 1st, where I'm going to be talking to someone who truly had a crazy 2020. He has a really, really interesting story that's going to keep you kind of on the on the edge of your seat in a way to see just what happens. And it involves going from Japan to China, China to Japan, and then Japan to China again. <laughs> so come back on February 1st. And just in case you're not aware, I do another podcast. It's called Ichimon Japan. Check it out. I also release two episodes a month for that one. And the last two episodes are all about annoying things in Japan. And don't worry, it's not just me complaining. I actually try to teach people about certain aspects of the things that we talk about and uh, crack a few jokes in the process. <laughs> so Ichimon Japan, uh, link in the show notes. But that's it. We're done. Thank you so much for listening. And remember... Go find your miniature pony. Just do it!